In this lecture, we'll be focusing on the vivid scene of thrones toppling, dynasties crashing down, and the sound of the collapse of empires. As the war ended in defeat for the central powers in 1918, their empires and political structures also came crashing down. In this sense, total war had led to total defeat. This lecture will outline first the startling internal collapse of the central powers, the collapse of the German Empire, then the Austro-Hungarian Empire, and the Turkish Empire, and will also survey the ongoing crash of the Russian Empire as well. In the case of each of these imperial structures, what order would replace the now extinct order was most certainly a burning question. The political map was in the process of being transformed. As a result of the war, four great empires came crashing down with astonishing rapidity and in the process also tore down the ruling families with them. The Russian Empire of the Romanov family, the German Empire ruled by the Hohenzollerns, the Austro-Hungarian Empire of the Habsburgs, and the Ottoman realm as well. In Europe, republics replaced dynastic kingdoms in what seemed to be a fulfillment of Woodrow Wilson's promise of a new democratic age. Nine new national states appeared out of the wreckage of empire. From north to south in Central Europe and Eastern Europe, Finland, Estonia, Latvia, and Lithuania, the three Baltic states, Poland, Hungary, Austria, Czechoslovakia, and Yugoslavia. So in other words, one witnessed the astonishing birth of new nations, as it were, arriving at the state of becoming nation states. But two key points need to be emphasized about this transformation. These new states were not merely created by the negotiators of the Paris Peace Conference soon underway. Rather, facts unfolded on the ground with astonishing speed suggesting that the appeal of nationalism and those ideas that Woodrow Wilson had announced of self-determination and associated democratic appeals were notions that had uh, an appeal far broader than merely that of the rhetorical plane. And some who view the what they would call the balkanization of Central and Eastern Europe as a great tragedy are prone to personalize this development by seeing Woodrow Wilson as responsible for it or having caused it by his rhetoric of self-determination. The reality was far more complex. On the contrary, Woodrow Wilson's articulated ideas would have such appeal because they corresponded to such mass sentiment. New independence for nationalities in Central and Eastern Europe also, and this is the second basic point, made for a very different perception of the war itself. One of the themes that we've been pursuing through this course has been that of the different meanings, the often starkly different meanings that were assigned to the war, both as it was going on and in its aftermath, by different participants or witnesses. Well, so too in this case, the aftermath of the war was seen not, as was sometimes the case in Western Europe, as senseless tragedy and waste and problematic victory, but was seen as something very different in Eastern Europe. Instead, often as a baptism of fire for national freedom and independence. Let's turn first to the crucial case of the German Revolution and Germany's beginning of an experiment, unfortunately a brief and failed experiment, with democratic government, starting with the German Revolution of November of 1918. After naval mutinies uh, to frustrate the intended uh, death ride plans of naval officers had broken out, and after revolts had broken out in other parts of Germany as well, the attempted revolution from above by Germany's elites to create a constitutional monarchy and to win more favorable consideration in a peace settlement had failed. Kaiser Wilhelm II abdicated and fled to exile in Holland, where he remained for the rest of his life. Generals Hindenburg and Ludendorff, meanwhile, had systematically sought to evade responsibility for the defeat. And this, in some sense, represented a crucial milestone in the growth of a conspiracy theory, the stab-in-the-back legend blaming 
not Germany's military leaders, but mysterious others for this defeat. Prince Max von Baden, who had been landed with the duties of Imperial Chancellor, now instead prepared for a transfer of power. He offered the power of the state and the government to surprise social democratic leaders who were caught unprepared. In a sense, there was a, a, a strange irony about this very moment. Social Democrats as a revolutionary party had long been insisting in their own propaganda and in their own beliefs, ideologically, that they were a party that was organizing to take power and to produce a fundamental social revolution within Germany as well. And now when the hour arrived, they were surprised and caught off guard. The social democratic leader, Friedrich Ebert, took over thus on November 9th, 1918. In this chaotic set of circumstances, his colleague, Philipp Scheidemann, declared a German democratic republic in Berlin. The new German experiment with democracy was beginning, but it was beginning in the context of great confusion. There was a sense in which the revolutionary events themselves were coming so fast and furious that it was difficult for observers and ordinary Germans to keep track of what it was that was happening. One of these observers commented that it seemed in these event-filled days that Germany had fallen asleep under an empire and then had woken up under a republic. In part, the confusion was further underlined and accelerated because there had not been planning during the course of the war itself for demobilization that might follow upon defeat. Now, this speaks volumes about the sense of the totality of the war. Total defeat or total victory See, it seemed to be the alternatives in years past, so that governments on all sides had not been thinking about the unthinkable. What would happen if your side lost? How would you prepare for an orderly demobilization? It seemed, on the contrary, that total victory was the only thinkable option. But now, it would have to be faced up to this fact that defeat was a reality. In the process, Germany was in a situation in which chaos and confusion were rife. To just enumerate some of the symptoms of this confusion, throughout Germany's cities and in the, in the barracks of the army and the garrisons of the sailors, local councils were being organized. And these were quite explicitly on the model of the Russian Soviets, which had been the grassroots councils of a sort of very basic democracy of the street that had taken such a trajectory in the Russian Revolution. At the same time, a socialist republic was being declared in Bavaria. Separatists were being mobilized in the Rhineland to perhaps establish an independent Rhineland state, maybe under French patronage. And these cases made very clear that perhaps Germany's own borders were not secure. Perhaps Germany's cohesion might be breaking down territorially due to these regional differences. And then add to this the fact that out in the streets of Germany, out in the barracks, there were now 10 million German soldiers who needed to be demobilized. They were armed. They wanted to go home. It was unclear if one or another political faction might win their sympathies, most certainly a potentially volatile force. And at the same time, to add just one last difficult problem, a revolutionary movement of radical socialists called the Spartacus Revolutionary Movement, after a slave rebel of classical times in the Roman Empire, uh, the Spartacus revolutionary movement was being organized and it planned actively the overthrow of anything less than a radical socialist state. This was symbolized perfectly by one fact. While the German democracy was being proclaimed by Scheidemann on November 9th of 1918 from the German parliament building, uh, just a few steps away from the balcony of the royal palace, a radical socialist by the name of Karl Liebknecht, who had held firm to his convictions during the co course of the war, was declaring a rival socialist republic, a radical socialist republic at that same time, promising a system that would link up and make common cause with the Bolshevik regime in the East. Uh, hoping to accelerate the progress of an international revolution.
There was something deeply, deeply symbolically laden about the declaration of this radical socialist, maybe even Soviet republic uh, from the royal palace. It was precisely here where four years previously, Wilhelm II had gone out to declare the domestic truce, arguing that the Burgfrieden or the peace of the castle was now a reality and that he saw before him only Germans. This unity of Germans, which had been breaking down desperately before, now would grow as a situation resembling civil war would start to develop. There was a paradox in this rivalry between different branches of the socialists. On the one hand, there were the moderate socialists, the social democrats, who had stood by Germany's war effort from the August Madness of 1914. On the other hand, there were the radical socialists who claimed that the majority socialist party had, had uh, betrayed the interests of the German working class and who wanted to push revolution fast and furious. The paradox here was that the SPD, the majority and more moderate socialists, had earlier been claiming that they too wanted revolution, but now they would find themselves faced with a challenge of trying instead to simply save order. Government leaders now fell back on an agreement which would come back to haunt them very quickly. The government leaders made an agreement with the German army for mutual assistance. The army extracted the promise that the German army itself would not be purged or cleansed of its traditional officer class. And in turn, the government won the active support of the army in staving off threats to its existence. In the process, the army, which was caught already in an increasing process of disintegration, as well as the government, set about hiring committed fighters who would take up the cause of the government. These were, in essence, brutal mercenaries who came to be called Freikorps, uh, essentially meaning free corps or free units, who would set out to quell revolts. And these Freikorps were of... Uh, a varied complexion. On the one hand, they included former soldiers, included stormtroopers who didn't want to end the existence of fighting but enjoyed it and wanted to prolong it. It also included students and, and younger boys, young men who had uh, felt that they'd missed out on the experience of fighting on the front but were now caught up in the civil war atmosphere that ruled in the streets of Germany. This was not a very auspicious beginning for the record of the German democracy which comes to be called the Weimar Republic. Now, the reason it's called the Weimar Republic is because the constitution of this democracy is written in southeastern Germany in the, a city of culture and associations uh, that were more liberal in nature than, than the imperial capital of Berlin, the city of Weimar, uh, and thus the entire state takes on the name of the Weimar Republic. The provisional government that ruled this young German democracy included the three parties that earlier in 1917 had supported the peace resolution and had spoken out against the hardline German nationalists. This provisional government was made up of the Social Democrats, the moderate majority Social Democratic Party. It included left liberals and it included the Catholic Center Party. In the elections for the Constituent Assembly, which would write the Constitution in Weimar, the elections which took place in January of 1919, a strong vote was returned, which seemed a considerable voice of support for the project of building a German democracy. These three parties, which oriented themselves democratically and pledged to introduce an effective German democracy, gained 76% of the vote in this new German election. This seemed to be a mandate for the building of a new German democracy, and in that sense, a good omen. The constitution, which was written then in Weimar, was considered a model of democracy, a model of progressive governance, an enlightened welfare state obligations growing in many senses out of the new role that the state had taken on in World War I. Uh, indeed, this new German democratic constitution was admired by Democrats, many Democrats worldwide. It included universal voting rights and the rights of women to vote, as well as a bill of rights and very extensive social commitments. Some historians, however, cautioned that maybe it was too democratic. 
It had a system of voting that's called proportional representation, which aimed to give even small groups a voice in the larger political landscape. But this system of proportional representation made for, in the end effect, a quite splintered parliament with many parties and introduced the danger that a small and very radical party might be able to, in a sense, get its foot in the door and then use the democratic process to subvert democracy, something that the Nazis later end up doing. At the same time, and most definitely a burden to this young German democracy, was the stab-in-the-back legend that was growing in conviction and force. In the minds of many, German democracy would come to be associated with defeat, and the terms of the Versailles Treaty that were being announced to an outraged German audience at precisely this time. Radical nationalists would soon be denouncing the government as not legitimate, but rather November criminals. And when German troops returned from the front, the government itself welcomed them as undefeated in the battlefield, in the words of the President Ebert. And this obviously raised a serious question. If the troops had been undefeated fighting on foreign soil, how then had Germany lost? The reality that Germany had been beaten because of a balance tipping against it in material and military terms, that was suppressed. Instead, the stab-in-the-back legend, Dolchstoßlegende in German, was already being circulated during the war and now proliferated, asserting that Germany's armies had been betrayed by treacherous elements on the home front. And with sort of a grim regularity, the groups that were scapegoated were democratic politicians, socialists, Catholics, as well as German Jews. Germany's ill-fated ally, Austria-Hungary, had also come crashing down. Even before the war's end, Austria-Hungary had been in the process of dissolving before the eyes of its leaders. National committees had been founded by the separate ethnic groups who increasingly clamored for independence. And exile politicians of these ethnic groups abroad, including in the United States, agitated the Western allies for recognition. At first, the reluctance of the Allies to see the Austro-Hungarian Empire simply dismembered was considerable. If they looked forward to restoring a balance of power, it might be very good to have one larger state like Austria-Hungary preserved. But with the intensity of hatreds and emotions of total war, that reluctance faded over time. From 1917, with those world historical events, the Russian March Revolution, which introduced a more democratic system, and the American entry into the war, and Woodrow Wilson's notion of a crusade for democracy, a new ideological emphasis took hold worldwide and condemned this multinational empire of the Habsburgs. Wilson's 14 points included the demand for the free, autonomous development of the peoples of the empire, and this soon would develop into a demand for independence. By the summer of 1918, the Allies were supporting the national claims to independence of the minorities and recognized exile committees. A key example was that of Czechoslovakia. A national committee had de facto been taking over power in the Czech lands and had been making common cause with the related ethnic group, the Slovaks, mobilizing one of the best organized national movements in Europe. Abroad, Tomasz Mazarik and Edward Benesch co-founded in exile the Czechoslovak National Council in London in Paris of 1915, and events now snowballed. On October 28, 1918, an independent Czechoslovak Republic was declared in Prague. Further south, in the Balkans, a pre-war South Slav movement, which aimed to unify the South Slavic peoples, the Croats, the Serbs, and others, led to the forming of a Yugoslav committee in exile in London of May of 1915, which united Serbs, Croatians, Montenegrins, and Slovenes. They then created the Corfu Declaration of July of 1917, in which Serbian representatives of other South Slav peoples agreed to the project of creating a combined Yugoslav state in the future, but its nature remained unclear. Would this be a greater Serbia expanded with other related peoples, or would it be more in the nature of a free and equal federation? That remained for the future. On October 29, 1918, an independent Yugoslavia was declared. Hungary itself, now as the empire melted away, even though it had been one of the major constituent parts of the obviously Austro-Hungarian empire, also split away from Habsburg rule. 
At first, on October 16, 1918, Hungary declared itself independent of ties from Austria, except for still having a common monarch, a Habsburg king, uh, king and emperor. On November 16, 1918, they went the next step. An independent Hungarian republic was declared under Prince Michael Karolyi. Austria now, and this is a, 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 almost a crazy paradox, Austria too now became independent of the Austro-Hungarian Empire. With the empire's collapse on November 12, 1918, an independent German Austria was declared in the expectation of soon joining the German Republic to the north. This small country of 7 million German-speaking Austrians was a shadow of its former power. This was essentially what was left of once great empire. Vienna had once been the capital of an empire of 50 million, and now it was an outsized imperial city in a small remnant of a country. The young emperor Karl, who had sought to save his regime, was dismayed by these events. In mid-October of 1918, the emperor had sought to save or salvage the situation by proclaiming a federal reorganization with autonomy promised to the nationalities in Austria, but this came too late. On November 3rd, 1918, the Austro-Hungarian armistice had been signed for a state that no longer existed. The Emperor Karl stubbornly refused to abdicate and instead went into exile to Madeira, dying young there. This represented the end of 600 years of Habsburg rule. And the Danube Basin, that entire region which the Austro-Hungarian Empire had united, once had been a political and economic coherent unit but now was torn apart, and the empire was separated into seven states. In another imperial hangover, five million Germans were now living as minorities outside of Austria or of Germany, and this was an ethnic problem stored up for the future. Independence now came in Eastern Europe as well, as the Russian Empire, which had begun its disintegration earlier, now further continued its disintegration in what really amounted to a process of decolonization uh, pursued earlier than that of the other European empires. Poland was a key example of this sort of emergence of what had been a submerged people into a really dynamic mobilization to achieve the long aspired to cause of national independence. Where earlier Polish forces of volunteers had been organized to fight under the auspices of the Austro-Hungarians as volunteer legions in the struggle to liberate Polish territories, and it was hoped to achieve national independence, the balance had tipped against the central powers. And the earlier leader of these legions, Piłsudski, had found himself incarcerated by the Germans. And so now the hopes came to rest upon the Allied powers. And the imperative was to win Allied sympathies for the cause of Polish independence. A key way in which this could be achieved was by demonstrating that the Poles were committed and participating in the active struggle against the central powers. And a very vivid uh, illustration of this was the existence of a military force called the Holler Army of 100,000 Poles who were fighting for the Allies in France on the Western Front. This army was made up of Polish exiles or former prisoners of war who had earlier been fighting for the central powers but now had found their way to the Holler Army to fight on the Western Front. Their commander, Haller, uh, had engaged in a tremendous odyssey to arrive at the Western Front. Uh, he had earlier been a commander under Austro-Hungarian uh, auspices of Polish troops. Now he uh, had broke through, broken through the front lines to the Russian Empire, defecting, and had come up through the Russian Empire itself in order to make the long journey to the northern port of Murmansk and to travel thence all the way to France in order to command this army of volunteers on the Western Front. This participation of Poles in an active military sense was recognized by the Allies. They were recognized as a fighting force, and Allied sympathies were won in a decisive way for Polish causes. Abroad, the nationalist politician Roman Dmowski and the world-famous pianist turned uh, politician Ignacy Paderewski both agitated for Polish independence. The effect was clear. Woodrow Wilson's 14 points agreed and made independent Poland a key war aim. November 11, 1918 is still celebrated as Poland's Independence Day.
The commander of Polish legions, Piłsudski, was freed from incarceration in a German jail and traveled to Warsaw to form a government there. And in spite of personal and political conflicts between these rivals, Piłsudski and Domowski, who would lead the delegation to the Paris Peace Conference, they together worked for a one united independent Poland, though its borders still remained unclear. At the same time, with the German collapse, the Baltic republics of Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia and Finland became young independent republics, though their independence remained fragile. Because German forces remained in the territory, the Bolsheviks moved forward to spread their revolution, and civil war threatened as well. To the south of what had been the lands of the Russian Empire, the Transcaucasian Republic included the former Russian territories of Armenia, Azerbaijan, and Georgia, uh, which soon were reconquered by the Bolsheviks uh, and only became independent again in our own times. Ottoman Turkey also collapsed with startling speed. Arabia had been made a separate state. Palestine, Iraq, Syria, and Transjordan would come under allied disposition, and the remaining parts of the empire now were occupied by the allies. Young Turk war leaders now fled into exile, escaping uh, calls for bringing them to trial uh, for their actions. The new sultan, Mehmed IV, cooperated with the Allies, but a nationalist counter-reaction set in against what was seen as this craven cooperation, and it was led, this nationalist movement, by a former young Turk, Mustafa Kemal, who later would be known as Ataturk, or Father of the Turks, who resisted the government as well as the Allied occupation, and eventually abolished the Sultanate, the last remnants of the Ottoman Empire, and created also a new state, a new nation, the Turkish nation state. What we've examined in today's lecture is the remarkable rapidity with which nationalist dreams for achieving national independence and a realization of long-held hopes for self-determination of the variety that Woodrow Wilson had been announcing would now finally have come true. We've also examined the difficult first stages of the founding of a German democratic state. Anxieties grew with the terms of the Versailles Treaty as they were announced to German democratic politicians. In May of 1919, the terms of the Versailles Treaty were presented to a shocked German public. And indeed, one German politician complained with a sense of anxiety and, and tremendous fear uh, arguing that these terms were ones that should not be imposed upon a German democracy, which had sought to fulfill some of Woodrow Wilson's ideas. This German politician exclaimed, what hand would not wither, what hand would not be paralyzed that laid itself in such chains by signing a Treaty of Versailles? The Paris Peace Settlement thus, which followed upon the achievement of this collapse of empires and the founding of new states represented a incomplete and unhappily incoherent answer, as it turns out, to a fundamental challenge of this new age. How to combine an attempt at the realization of Woodrow Wilson's democratic message of a crusade to make the world safe for democracy and to achieve a new world order founded upon more democratic governments on the one hand, with the demands that had grown out of the emotions, the hatreds, the passions of the war itself for a reigning in and a revenge for the crimes of the enemy side. The Paris Peace Settlement, uh, a whole complex of treaties that would be signed with the defeated powers, and in addition, among these treaties, the most important of them, the Treaty of Versailles that would be imposed upon uh, a defeated Germany as the centerpiece of this entire settlement, would leave traumatized international politics and raise once again the question of how such problems might be solved through peaceful settlement rather th than through a recurrence of the same sort of total war which the future held in store. It's precisely this dynamic of the crafting, the writing, and the attempt at the creation of the Paris Peace Settlement and the Treaty of Versailles itself with a defeated Germany that we'll be examining in much more detail in our lecture to follow.